What's up, you bio penguins? So I think that we got all the technology issues figured out. Um, so I should be now live on the right account. So you should actually be able to see it. Um, so hi, I'm Mrs. Jones, um, and I run AP Bio Penguins. Um, and so today we're going to be working on the cell. We're going to talk about um, the different parts of the cell as well as how things move across a membrane. Um, so if you are taking AP Bio, you are of course in the right place. Um, so. I believe that students are all dressed for success and that you sitting in this room right now means that you are ready to be successful on the AP bio exam. So you are now a penguin, which means that you are now dressed for success. Um, so just quick reminder, like I'm sure that you already know about all these resources because of the fact that you are of course already a penguin. Um, but in case you don't know, I'm doing live review every single day. I've started on February 1st and I've been doing live, um, not live review, sorry, review every single day, daily review on my Instagram stories. So there's just like quick questions. It's designed as a Insta review. Um, so it's supposed to be quick content questions that go over like the information about biology. There's also a 374 page review guide that's on my Weebly. Um, as well as every single uh, weekend, I've been recording FRQ Fridays and post those on YouTube, as well as I've got all the ones I've made throughout the school year. There's 120 review games posted on my Weebly, as well as there's review PowerPoints. And then it seems that every, like twice a month, I've been doing these live streams to kind of help you to review all the content for the AP exam. Um, and of course, as we go through all this information today, you're welcome to drop those questions into the chat on YouTube. Um, and I'll be, of course, able to answer those as I come across them. I don't know what the lag looks like between you and me. Um, so as soon as I see your question, I, of course, will do my best to answer it. So today's plan, we're going to talk about the different organelles. We're going to talk about membrane transport, so how things get across the membrane. Um, and then we're going to do some practice questions, and then I'll open up the floor. So if there's any questions that you might have about Unit 2, we can do a Unit 2 Q&A just to make sure that you've got all of your questions answered. Um, so first things first, let's talk about the cell and about the organelle. So here's a little quick little cell, okay? Um, so the most important kind of part of your whole cell, of course, is the nucleus. This is where the genetic material is going to be. Your DNA is located here. Um, so uh, I kind of have the idea that we would go through these as looking at their structure as well as their function. Um, so when we think about the nucleus, its structure is going to be a double membrane. So it's got these two membrane layers, um, and that's called your nuclear envelope, and it has these little pores. These pores are what's allowing your mRNA to leave the nucleus to go out to the cytosol for the translation process, um, as well as we have different proteins that are synthesized, for example, the ribosomes, that will make their way into the, um, not the ribosomes, I'm so sorry, um, different proteins and enzymes will make their way into the nucleus um, to allow for transcription, not translation, sorry, y'all. Um, and then different functions of our nucleus. It stores our genetic material, which would be our RNA, this is where we have uh, transcription taking place, that synthesis of that RNA. And then this is where we're going to assemble our ribosomes. Um, so of course we know that the rRNA is made in there and then you of course put all the mRNA, all the other stuff together, which then of course makes your ribosomes. Well, you've got the protein plus your rRNA that makes your, your ribosomes. Um, so rough RNA, so the rough ER is going to be the location that we have. And of course I've got a little circled right here. It's going to be these little flat little sections um, outside of the nucleus, actually connected to the nucleus in terms of its membrane being connected. Um, and the rough ER is studded with ribosomes. So there's these little ribosomes that are attached to it. Um, and so what that does is that allows for there to be a location where you can have translation in which you can have these proteins synthesized in a membrane. So when we talk about membrane transport, we're gonna mention how there's these different proteins in the membrane. Well, they got there because of the fact that it was a rough ER, the ribosome on the ER, that allowed for the synthesis of that protein. This is also how we're going to synthesize um, proteins that are going to be secreted. So when we talk about exocytosis and things being released from the cell, and they're going to be surrounded by membrane in that little vesicle, that moves to the membrane, of course, it goes through that exocytosis process, that was synthesized in the rough ER. Um, so it's also important for our cell compartmentalization as well as mechanical support, and it has a role in that intracellular transport, as we already mentioned, the little vesicles moving. We also have a smooth ER. So our smooth ER is going to be um, where we have the, um, it's an extension of the rough ER, um, and this is going to just be, of course, a membrane, but it does not have any of those um, ribosomes on it. I'm going to see if I can move the camera so that you can actually see the stuff that's on the, uh, the page. Um, so we have our 
um, little cisterna, which make up the smoothie R. Um, and of course, as I said, there's no ribosomes on this structure. So this is going to be important for detoxification. So where we're having um, any type of toxins that might be in the cell, we will, of course, use this to detoxify. Um, if you're talking about a muscle cell, um, it has a sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is a type of smoothie R, and this stores our calcium. So we'll learn later, and we get into unit four, about calcium being a secondary messenger. And so calcium will be stored inside of the smoothie R, and it can then be released out to act as a secondary messenger in cell communication in our transduction pathway. Um, as well as it's also important for our lipid synthesis. So this is where we can synthesize a lot of our steroids and other lipids um, that are needed, of course, by our cell. So next thing we have is our Golgi apparatus. And notice that I, of course, am surrounded by kind of circling each of these. So we have our little Golgi. It's these little stacks. Um, and this is where we're going to package and modify the uh, materials that were made by the rough ER. So proteins will be synthesized in the rough ER that then will go over to our Golgi for that modification. This also modifies other things like carbohydrates and other things. I went to a really cool presentation um, at UGA when we did Science Olympiad, and the uh, researcher that was doing the speech was talking about how He's investigating the Golgi and how the modifications of the carbohydrates that were done in that Golgi apparatus. Um, so, um, and I just mentioned Golgi apparatus. The Golgi apparatus is the same thing as the Golgi complex, the same thing as the Golgi bodies. All three terms are kind of interchangeably used. Um, anyway, so this is where we're going to, of course, have our little flattened sacs, this is our surname, um, and this is in charge, uh, responsible for packaging and modifying our different synthesized proteins as well as it kind of works with the, the traffic. As I said, the rough ER is where we're going to synthesize those proteins. They then go to their, our Golgi apparatus um, for that packaging and modification, and then it will end up moving to our plasma membrane to be released and secreted from the cell. We also have ribosomes, which, as I've already mentioned them, you kind of already know what those are. They're made up of two par parts. You have a large subunit and a small subunit. Um, and we'll get more into this when we get into Unit 6, um, and we talk about uh, transcription. Um, we have a small subunit, which is where you're going to bind the mRNA, and then the large subunit is where the tRNA is going to come in. And so the large subunit and the small subunit will work together so that you can um, translate that mRNA. So the mRNA will be red. Um, it's going to be, of course, nucleotides. It will be red, and then we're going to put amino acids in order. So the process of translation is reading the mRNA and synthesizing the amino acid chain, which is your polypeptide. Um, and so we can find these either bound or free. They all start out being free ribosomes, and then those free ribosomes, once given a signal, will travel to the rough ER to finish the synthesis of that protein in the membrane or on the, the membrane surface. Um, and so, of course, these are made up of our, um, <laughs> we'll have our uh, rough ER and our, I'm sorry, our rRNA and our proteins. My husband's trying to send me messages and I have nuclear so you can't see screen. Okay, thank you. Um, so we have our functions, which is our protein synthesis. Um, and of course, this is where we're going to synthesize our protein for that translation. Um, I'm going to give up on this one. I was told that, this, that you couldn't see the screen on one of the, the platforms that I was trying to stream from, so I'm just going to turn that one off. <laughs> okay, so uh, other organelles we have is the mitochondria. Okay, so the mitochondria is going to be really important when we get into Unit 3 and we start talking about um, the cellular energetics and the energy. Um, and so it's made up, of course, this double membrane. The outer membrane surrounds the organelle, and then we have this inner membrane, which we're going to call the cristae. Okay, um, and so the cristae is important because this is where we're going to see our um, the third step of cellular respiration, which is oxidophosphorylation, is going to take place here. We're going to see our electron transport chain in that membrane, um, which is where we'll see all those cytochromes, and the electron will get transferred down, um, which will allow it to release energy, and it will pump its protons out into this intermembrane space, which is just the space that we see between the inner membrane and that outer membrane, or between the cyst, uh, the cristae and the outer membrane, is that inner membrane space, or the space between membranes. Notice also that it has DNA, as well as it has ribosomes. The endosymbiotic theory states that um, the mitochondria, and when we talk about the chloroplasts in a second, that they are believed to be prokaryotes. And so that's one of our pieces of evidence, is that it has its own DNA, that DNA is circular, and that it has its own ribosomes. So it's actually not part of the... Um, 
under the endomembrane system where like we've got this system that you connect all of the parts by membrane um, this is not actually connected to the membrane in terms of um, sending materials to that mitochondria um, in order for major processes um, so Talking about it, double membrane, outer membrane, inner membrane, highly folded. It's highly folded because it increases our surface area that we're needing in order for us to um, have the uh, more ATP synthesized through oxidative phosphorylation. Um, I'm going to move my camera back over so that y'all can see the text as I put it up in a second. Okay. Um, sorry, y'all. So we also see that we have a function of it's for the cytooxidative phosphorylation in terms of the inner membrane and the cristae. Um, and then in the matrix, so the space that we see on the inside of our cristae, this is our matrix. This is where we're going to find the, the Krebs cycle taking place, that second step of cellular respiration. Um, and in case you're wondering why glycolysis isn't up here, remember the glycolysis is actually part of um, in the cytosol or outside of the mitochondria. Um, so we also have our chloroplast. As I said, this is also part of endosymbiotic theory, believing that this is a prokaryote. Um, so it is made up of, of course, it has a, technically a triple membrane, but that's okay. So it's an outer membrane, inner membrane, and then our thylakoid also has um, this inner, like this, a, a membrane that surrounds it. Um, and so the thylakoid are these little sacs. Um, and in the membrane of the thylakoid is where you're going to find your chloroplast. And your chloroplast is, not your chloroplast, sorry, your uh, chlorophyll. Your chlorophyll is going to be the pigment that's going to absorb that solar energy, that light uh, energy, and it's going to um, fuel the process of uh, photosynthesis, okay? And then again, also it has its own DNA as well as it has its own uh, ribosomes. Um, somebody's asking, is the inner membrane the same as the cristae? Yes, in the mitochondria, that inner membrane is the same as the cristae. Um, and as we saw before, we have an increase of surface area in terms of our thylakoid to allow there to be more space for um, absorption of that solar radiation um, so that you could then, of course, convert that uh, light energy into um, chemical energy in terms of a G3P or uh, photosynthesis. Okay? Um, so again, we have a double outer membrane. The thylakoid sac is stacked. It has a granum, or the little sacs are called granum. And then the fluid is the stroma. Inside the stroma is where we're going to see the Calvin cycle or the Calvin Benson cycle, if you want to use the full name for it. The thylakoid or these little sacs right here, this is where we see our light reactions. And we'll talk about light reactions in the Calvin cycle a little bit more when we get into photosynthesis in unit three in like two or three weeks. <laughs> um, and as we said, this is the site of photosynthesis. And so let's talk about some of our other organelles. We have our lysosome. Lysosome's job is going to be for uh, digestion. Okay. Um, so if you think about like a macromolecule, um, I'm sorry, macromolecule, a macrophage, a macrophage is going to go in and it's going to engulf bacteria that has infected your body. Um, and so what we're going to see is that the macro, bac, bleh, macrophage is going to engulf this bacteria and then it has to digest that bacteria. So the lysosome is going to fuse with something called a food vacuole. So we go through phagocytosis, which is that process where they're going to engulf this material. Um, that food vacuole is going to fuse with the lysosome. The lysosome is a sac filled with hydrolytic enzymes. Hydrolytic enzymes are, of course, going, going to go through hydrolysis. If you remember from unit one, hydrolysis is where we're going to be breaking bonds. Um, so they have hydrolytic enzymes that are going to break down this bacteria um, into the little remnants of bacteria, and then it will use all the resources it needs, and anything that is wasted, it will then kick it out. Um, and so it's function, intracellular digestion, recycles our cell, our different organic materials, as well as this is responsible for our programmed cell death, which is apoptosis. Um, so this is where we can kind of um, relieve, receive the signal. Um, I believe it's like a CED3 and a CED4 signal, but don't quote me on that. Um, and that causes little bleeds. Um, so the cell basically can digest itself from the inside out um, so that it can go through that uh, programmed cell death or apoptosis. So vacuole. There's multiple different types of vacuoles that we have. Um, so the big thing about this is it is a membrane bound sac. Um, and so it has different functions. Main thing is it's for storage and releasing of macromolecules and our different cellular waste products. Um, so central vacuole is gonna be found in our plant cells. Um, and so this is going to be for water retention. We'll store a bunch of water inside of our um, central vacuole. And that provides the turker pressure. Um, so it's going to have that high water pressure pushing out against the wall, which allows the rigidity for our plant cell. We also have our contractile vacuole. Contractile vacuole is for osmoregulation. So um, what's happening is like there is this organism, a unicellular organism, that lives in a uh, freshwater environment. And because 
water is going to naturally roll into that cell. We don't want it to burst. Um, and so the contractile vacuole is going to take that water and it's going to basically contract, which pushes the water back out of the cell. And we're going to do a practice question with this in a little bit. And then our food vacuole, as we mentioned before, is due to phagocytosis. We go through phagocytosis. You have these little pseudopoda. They come out. They extend out around the food particle. Um, and then that's going to fuse with our lysosome for the digestion to take place. So big thing about this, of course, we have math in this. Surface area to volume ratio. Okay. So there's four different ones you're going to have to be able to do for the EP exam. Um, so this, of course, we have our sphere. You'll have to, of course, be able to use these formulas. They're given to you on the formula sheet, so don't worry about trying to memorize them. Um, you also have to be able to do a cube, a rectangular solid, as well as a cylinder. Um, different questions I could see them maybe asking you would be potentially having you calculate surface area volume ratio of one of these, um, or they may give you two different cells and ask you to tell me which one is more favorable. Um, and so the big thing to understand about this is that the best cell is a cell that has a high surface area to volume ratio. So there's a lot more surface area and less volume for the actual cell. This has to do with diffusion. If you have a really, really big cell, it takes a lot longer for materials to diffuse from the plasma membrane throughout the cell. Um, and so the smaller the, the interior part of the cell is and the higher the surface area, you have more area for the nutrients to come in, the waste to go out, um, as well as all these other processes that happen within the cell. We want them to occur very quickly. Um, and so one question they could also ask you is giving you two different surface area volume ratios and asking you which cell would be more favorable. And the answer is always going to be the one with the higher surface area to volume ratio. Um, and so they could do some math with that. So our next thing we need to look at is our membrane transport. So how things move across our cell. So first thing, let's talk about the plasma membrane. So plasma membrane is made up of a phospholipid bilayer. And if you remember from last time, we talked about the phospholipid it has this phosphate group and then it has these hydrophobic tails. Okay? Um, and so it has that glycerol, the one phosphate, which is uh, negatively charged. And then it has these two fatty acid tails. Those could be um, saturated or unsaturated. It kind of all depends on what we're looking at. Okay, we also have cholesterol sitting in here. Cholesterol is going to act as a buffer. So if it gets too hot, it stops the membrane from having these big gaping holes. And if it gets too cold, it stops the membrane from becoming too solid. Um, so it acts as a buffer to allow the membrane to stay fluid. We also have different proteins in there. So these proteins are going to allow for materials to move across that membrane. And then we can have glycolipids and glycoproteins. Glycolipids and glycoproteins, they're responsible for cell communication. Um, glyco meaning sugar, and then lipid just means it is a sugar attached to a lipid. And then glycoprotein means that I've got a sugar attached to a protein. Um, as I said, cell, cell communication for this. Um, so as I said, made up of phospholipids, it has a membrane protein, glycolipids, and the glycoproteins, as well as there's that cholesterol that's making up this membrane, okay? So there's different types of membrane transfer. First thing we have is simple diffusion. Simple diffusion is going to be passive transport. It does not require any energy. And in case you're wondering what I'm saying here, NRG is energy, like energy. Like you're making energy, okay? Um, so this is going to go down a constant drain. So I always tell my students that we have, um, if you're at the top of a hill, okay? All you have to do is just push yourself off the edge and you will go down that hill without any trouble. That is passive. You don't have to pump your, your pedals and your bike at all. You've got that stored energy that's allowing you to move down that. So that stored energy is usually a concentration gradient. And so what we see is that materials are going to move down their concentration gradient. So they move directly through the membrane. This is things that are small and nonpolar that are going to go through simple diffusion. So like your oxygen, your carbon dioxide, your nitrogen, your steroids, these things that are small and hydrophobic, small and nonpolar, they can easily pass through the membrane. Now, something I didn't know until I was like really looking through the CED, in case you don't know what the CED is, CED is the curriculum that is used by all the teachers as well as College Board to determine what's on the exam. Um, and so when I was going through the CED, I discovered that there's actually a small amount of water that can leak through. Now, I don't know if that's going to show up in any of your questions, but it is important to know that a very, 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 very small amount of water is able to just kind of leak through the membrane. Um, so there's that. Um, there's a question in the chat that says, how are eukaryotes different from prokaryotes on a cellular level? Um, so eukaryotes are going to have a nucleus, while prokaryotes do not have a nucleus. Um, eukaryotes are going to be larger. 
prokaryotes are going to be smaller. The reason why a eukaryote is able to be larger is because it has these membrane-bound organelles. It's got the rough ER, it's got the Golgi, it's got the lysosome. Any of those organelles that I mentioned before, except for the ribosome, is not found in a prokaryote. It will all be found in a eukaryote cell. Um, and so our prokaryote is just going to be uh, a nucleoid, which is a region where that nucleus is, I'm sorry, the region where the, the uh, genetic material is. And then it has those ribosomes and then um, just like cytosol. Like it doesn't really have a lot of those organelles in there. And so because of that compartmentalization that we have with eukaryotes with those organelles, that allows the eukaryotic cell to be larger. So I hope that that answered your question about eukaryotes versus prokaryotes. Okay, so back to membrane transport. So we also have facilitated diffusion. Facilitated diffusion is going to be um, using some type of helper, and that helper is going to be a protein. So this is still passive transport. It still does not require any type of energy. You, it's still going down a concentration gradient. We're still at the top of the hill going down, okay? Um, the difference now is, is that we need some type of um, transport protein to allow things to go across. So this is either gonna be a channel protein or a carrier protein. So channel protein is what we see down here. This is a channel protein. So it has like this kind of channel in the middle of it that's allowing for the materials to pass through. It is still very specific for what passes through it. Um, and so the material will of course bind to an active site on this protein that's allowing it to move through that um, membrane um, through the channel protein, okay? Um, and then carrier proteins are going to actually kind of carry it across. So I always tell my students, which I don't have any of like the cool things. I guess I can use this like tomato for my child's uh, play toys. Anyways, so if it's going to bind, so it binds here on the cell, like on our uh, protein, okay? And once it binds, we know that anytime you bind something to a protein, it always changes shape. So that change of shape is going to move it across the membrane. And so, of course, binds, changes shape, which then moves it across. Um, so in case you didn't see that, it was dropping out of my hands, um, moving across that membrane. And so different things that do this, water does this, um, sodium, potassium, calcium, all these different charged materials um, that are still small um, or things that are just polar hydrophilic, those are the materials that are going to need a transfer protein to move across the membrane, okay? Um, and then that's when we have is active transport, which give me a second, I'm gonna move the camera again so that you'll be able to see um, the information that's on the slide because um, I realized last time that I kept covering things up. <laughs> so active transport is going to require an input of energy. There needs to be energy. We're going from the bottom of the hill now, and we have to pedal our bike to move to the top of that hill. Um, and so it requires input of energy. We also are going to need some type of transport protein to get across that membrane. Um, usually we see this in the form of a carrier protein. Um, and so, as I said, it's good against the gradient. And so we, we could also see this with, again, our charged materials, our sodium potassium, um, hydrogen ions, uh, protons, if you may. Um, and so those are going to be a form of active transport. So I've seen these in terms of like sodium potassium pumps or proton pumps. Um, and usually when we're talking about active transport, we see the word pump in the, the information, okay? Um, so that was all things that were moving across our membrane. What if something's too big? So that's where a bulk transport comes into play. So this would be like endocytosis. Endocytosis, endo makes us think of coming in, like inside, okay? Um, so with endocytosis, this is how we're going to bring something into our cell. So we have three different types that we're going to discuss. The first one is phagocytosis, which we already mentioned before, but I'm mentioning it again. We have these little pseudopods, okay? So the little pseudopods are going to kind of extend out, and they're going to surround the food molecule. And when that, of course, it's a... a phospholipid bilayer, these things are individual little phospholipids that kind of move in, in between each other. Um, and so that's going to surround it, and that forms that food vacuole that we mentioned before was going to fuse with our lysosome, so we make our food vacuole. So that is called phagocytosis, cellular eating. Penocytosis is right here, okay? Penocytosis is going to be where we are gulping extracellular fluid, okay? Um, and so, again, it's going to, invaginase is going to make this little kind of uh, saccomose where the fluid comes in and any of the um, solutes that might be dissolved in that extracellular fluid is going to come in with it. And so a student of mine, my first year, he was like, I know a way to remember cellular drinking. He says, uh, when you drink a lot, it makes you pee. No, penocytosis. So if that helps you, awesome. If not, you can just laugh at me. It's fine. Um, and then the last one we have is receptor mediated endocytosis. So we have these different proteins on the membrane. As we've already mentioned before, there's all these proteins. They do lots of things. 
And so one of the things they do is act as a receptor in cell communication. And so cell communication is until unit four, uh, but let's have a little quick little blip right now, okay? So these little ligands, what happens is that they're going to bind to the receptor. That causes some type of response, and that response is the invagination. So it's going to then bring in this certain solute once it once that uh, ligand binds to that receptor. So we call that receptor mediated in the cytosis because that receptor was kind of um, signaled to make the the little endocytosis process. Okay. So other type of uh, transport we have is things going out of my cell. Okay. So this would be exocytosis. So remember that is exiting where exocytosis things are moving out this was a little bit easier you literally just have this little vesicle the vesicle moves closer to the membrane until it kind of fuses and then of course they're little molecules so they just vibrate move past each other which then of course opens it up allowing for whatever was inside that vesicle to release out this is usually when we're talking about our rough ER, we synthesized the protein in the rough ER, it then went to the Golgi and then that vesicle moves to the plasma membrane for exocytosis. Oh, I didn't press the button. I'm sorry, y'all. So we have the export materials. You have the rough ER, which is inside the Golgi, um, which you package and modify, and then, of course, our plasma membrane. So, whew, on to osmosis, which this tends to be, like, the complicated one for students. Students have trouble um, with osmosis and about some of these words that we have in osmosis, okay? So first thing, let's look at the words. Hypertonic, isotonic, and hypotonic. Hyper makes you think of a high concentration of something, like high, hyper, high, okay? Iso is the same, and then hypo, hypo, is low. Um, wouldn't a charged particle have to be polar? Yes, your charged particles are polar, um, and does exocytosis need energy? Yes, exocytosis does require ATP. There is energy that is done with that. Um, so yes, it does use ATP. That is an active transport um, process. Um, okay, so... Hypertonic, we said high concentration, hypo is low. So students always have trouble because um, you have to think about them in respect to something else, okay? I am short, so I'm a very short person. I know that it doesn't, like a lot of y'all don't believe that, but I'm short, I'm like 5'2", okay? So my husband is 5'10", 5 5'11", 5 I really don't know, okay? My husband is taller than me, right? So I am shorter than my husband. But my mom, love her so much, she is shorter than me. She's 5'1", okay? So in respect to my mother, I am tall, okay? So it all depends on where you're looking at. A hypertonic solution could be hypotonic if it has a more hypertonic solution next to it. Mm -hmm. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. Anyways, so in terms of this, I always like to think about the water. So the numbers that they're telling you is the solute, what's dissolved in the solution, okay? And so here I have a low solute concentration, okay? There is no solute actually in this. This would be like distilled water. It is zero molar. Here, let's call this five molar just because I can see I have five of these little particles. Let's just call this five molar just to make life easy, okay? So this is a five molar solution. So notice over here, there are 24 free water molecules. And over here, I only have these four molecules that are free, okay? So water's gonna move from where there's a high concentration to a low concentration, okay? So you have to think about that the hypotonic solution has more free water and the hypertonic solution has less free water. So water moves from high to low. Water will move from hypotonic to hypertonic. Let's say that one more time to make sure we have it. And you can say it with me if you'd like. Water will always move from a hypotonic solution to a hypertonic solution, okay? And so here you can kind of see that, that there's a high water potential. Water potential just has to do with the potential for water to move, okay? So water moves from high water potential to low water potential. And so in this beaker that has this little semi-permeable membrane, you can see the water has moved over to this side. So what that's doing is it's, the goal is for it to have the same concentration. That's why water is moving over. is because the less water I have here, it increases the concentration. And the more water I have over here decreases the concentration so it can hopefully become the same concentration because everything wants equilibrium, right? Cool. So hypertonic means high solute concentration and low free water. It's going to gain water from a hypotonic solution. Isotonic solution means that they're going to be equal. Water still moves. Water moves this way, water moves that way. It's still going to move across that membrane, but it's equal movement of that water. So it's kind of isotonic. Nothing's really going to happen there, okay? And then hypotonic solution means that I have a low solute concentration, but a high free water concentration. This will lose water to a hypertonic solution, 
Okay. So different things happen in different types of cells. And I just realized that that was covering up. So let me move the camera so you can see what was on the hypotonic side. Okay. So if we're looking at water, I'm sorry, a plant. Okay. A plant cell placed into a hypertonic solution. I'm sorry. Yeah. In a hypertonic solution is going to cause the water to flow out of the cell. Okay, so the water leaves the cell, which causes a plasmolysis. It kind of shrinks. So the cell wall stays where it is, but the plasma membrane pulls away from that cell wall. Okay, so this is called plasmolysis. Isotonic solution is just flaccid. It's kind of limp. It's not really like, eh, it's, it doesn't like to be that way. But it's limp. It's fine, whatever. Okay, versus a hypotonic solution. Okay, I said that backwards. No, I didn't. No. Yeah, okay. So a hypotonic solution is going to cause the water to move into my cell, okay, which makes it turgid, okay, it makes it structure. As we said before with our central vacuole, okay, the water is going to move into my central vacuole, which then gives it that rigidity, that structure, that pressure, that turgid pressure, and that makes this nice and, you know, erect, okay, and that is favorable for a plant cell. Versus if you look at an animal cell, hypertonic solution, this causes crenation or shriveling of our red blood cells. Isotonic, water moves in and out the same amount. Um, and so this is going to cause, um, this is actually like normal. So if you've ever gone to like the hospital and you've ever heard of them putting saline in a person, that's because they have a concentration of the saline, the water, it's a salt water solution that is equal to the concentration of your red blood cells so that your red blood cells are in this favorable condition. Your cells aren't gonna burst or they're not gonna shrivel like it's favorable, okay? Um, versus if we put in, if we put the still water in your bloodstream, um, it's going to cause those cells to burst, um, or the word that we would use is lysis. Um, so as a, as just a reminder, this was plasmolysis. This was flaccid. This was turgid. This is crenation. This is, I guess, normal. <laughs> and then this is going to be, um, lysis, um, or burst. So I hope that was helpful. Okay. That was all I had to do. Okay, cool. So we've got a couple practice questions to go over and then we're done with the unit too. Okay, right, so common laboratory experiment involves putting a solution of starch and glucose into a dialysis bag and suspending the bag in a beaker of water. Did you do this lab? Go ahead and answer in the chat if you did this lab. As a structure in the function, I'm sorry, as shown in the figure below, the investigation is aimed at understanding how molecular size affects movement through a membrane. Which of all best represents the amount of starch, water, and glucose in the dialysis bag over the course of investigation? Um, so how many of you are looking at this? Like, I don't know what to do. Like, that's a little scary. And I don't remember this experiment. I may have done this experiment, but I don't remember this experiment. So I want to show you that sometimes you can figure out answers without knowing any information. Um, so is hypertonic and hypotonic when you're in the water too long, you start to look like a prune? Um, yes, to an extent. Yes. So some of the water comes out. Um, which then causes you to be a little uh, kind of shrivelly. So that's that's one of the reasons. But there, I did research on it a while ago. I don't remember the exact reason, but that was part of it. That wasn't the whole reason. Anyways, so when you look at this, you can get this without knowing any biology. Okay, so let's talk about that. So if we look here, we see the starch is found on the inside of my dialysis tubing, right? So this is before, and then afterward, starch is still on the inside. It did not move out. And so if I look at my key, it shows me that this dotted line is starch. So I would expect my starch to stay at the exact same concentration. It says relative amount of dialysis of amount in dialysis bag. So I would expect the amount in the bag to stay the same because of the fact that none of it left, right? I didn't gain any, I didn't lose any, like it's still in the, the dialysis tubing. So I know that this answer is out and this answer is out because both of those involved something happening like this one showed that it increased and that one also showed that it increased so both of these are showing that the amount of um starch increased which we know is not true because the the starch is the same amount in both okay so next we are going to look at the glucose so the glucose started out inside the dialysis tube but after the experiment there was some in the solution so it still was in the tube but there's also some in the solution so that means that the amount that was in my baggie has been removed. Like some of it came out of my baggie. Okay. And so if I look here, of course, the glucose is going to be the solid line. Okay. So here I see the solid line decreases versus here I see the solid line increases. This is telling me that glucose 
came into my baggie. Well, the glucose wasn't in the solution before. It was leaving the baggie. Moving to the solution would mean there was a less concentration inside the bag. So I would then remove that answer choice, leaving me with this being my answer, okay? Where I have, of course, water increase. You can see that this one is like itty bitty and now it has gained and it's not like full of water. Um, and so you can see that the water increased, the glucose decreased and the starch stayed the same. So I hope that was helpful. Um, so the next one we have is our paramecium. This is the uh, unicellular organism I was talking about before. They have contractile vacuoles that remove the excess intracellular water. In an experimental investigation, paramecia were placed in salt solutions of increasing osmolarity. Basically, there's more salt or there's a higher amount of solute in that solution. So as I increase osmolarity, I'm seeing this decreasing in my rate of uh, contraction. So the rate at which the uh, contractile vacuole pumped out the excess water was determined and plotted against osmolarity as shown in the graph. Which of the following is a correct explanation of this data? So sometimes let's just take a moment and look at our graph. Okay, so I can see in my graph that when I have a low osmolarity, I'm in a hypotonic solution, I can see that my rate of contraction is high that uh, contractile vacuole is pumping a ton of water out of my cell because logically I'm in a low concentration. So water's rushing into this paramecia, okay? Versus over here, when it's in a hypertonic solution, it's very high concentration. I'm seeing that there's a low amount of contraction. There's not much water rushing into my cell, so the contractions are a lot lower, okay? So as osmolarity increases, I see my rate of contraction decreases. And I make myself that little note there so that I know that as I look through my answer choices, I can remember that fact, okay? And you could just write this out as like an arrow up and an arrow down. I just wanted to make a full sentence for you, okay? So let's look through our answer choices. At higher osmolarity, lower rates of contraction are required. Well, yeah, when I'm at a high concentration, there's a low amount of, when I'm at a high concentration, there's a low amount of contraction. That's a true statement because more salt diffuses in the paramecia. Well, we're not looking at the salt. We're looking at water moving and the contractile vacuole's job is to pump excess water out. So I know that A is not the right answer. Let's look at B. Contraction rate increases, osmolarity decreases. I wrote that because the amount of water entering the paramecia by osmosis increases. So if I go this way, do I have more water rushing into my cell? Well, that's a true statement. Okay, so B sounds like a good answer right now. But we don't want to just stop there. We do want to finish looking at our answer choices. C, contractile vacuum is less efficient in solutions of high osmolarity because of the reduced amount of ATP produced from cellular respiration. Why would I have less cellular respiration? This is literally just looking at a vacuole and it pumping. The osmolarity, the concentration of salt or solute outside of my cell has nothing to do with the amount of ATP. So that one also is not a logical answer. D, in an isoosmotic salt solution, so when this iso, is, yeah, isotonic, so I have the same amount of concentration in my cell as outside my cell, there is no diffusion of water inside or outside the, the cell. That's a true statement. So the contraction rate is zero. Well, that's not really showing me what I'm seeing in my graph. That's kind of some other extension. So the right answer here is, of course, D, because it shows exactly what we came up with and it's talking about that water movement, which is what we were studying with this question. So hope that was helpful. So we have two FRQ questions, and then I'll open up the floor for any questions that y'all might have. Okay. So free response on 2018, number six, cystic fibrosis is a genetic condition that is associated with defects in the CFTR protein. So literally it's the, the transport protein. Um, and so this protein is a gated ion channel that requires ATP binding in order to allow chloride ions to diffuse across the membrane. So it's telling us that I have something that's allowing things to move across the membrane. So I know that this protein must be in my plasma membrane in order for this to be taking place. And let me see if I can move the camera. Um, I keep forgetting that I, the camera might be covering things up. Okay, so hopefully that's good. Okay. Um, so first, A asks us to use our model and draw arrows to describe the pathway for production of a normal CFTR protein from gene expression to find the, the final cellular location. So if we look here, we've got this membrane, this, this cell, okay? Now this is similar to what you might have to do on question five in terms of your fear response. Number five is going to ask you to modify a diagram or do something with a diagram, okay? So if it's asking us about gene expression, we know that we've got our DNA inside of our nucleus. 
and that that DNA is going to have to be transcribed in order to be translated by ribosome. So if we're trying to talk about pathway for the normal protein from gene expression, that means that I've got to go from the nucleus to my rough ER or specifically to a ribosome, okay? So from that ribosome, if you went to a ribosome, you had to come back to, of course, our rough ER. We're then going to go to our Golgi. So we synthesize our protein in our rough ER. We then go to the Golgi for package and modification. And then we move to the plasma membrane, okay? So the final answer has to end up at that membrane. You have to have an arrow that goes right from nucleus to membrane or in this little stepwise formation, okay? And the reason why is because this showed the gene expression, the whole path that it took. Um, you could not extend your arrow past the plasma membrane because that shows that the materials are being secreted from the cell, which is not what we know is happening. We know it'll end up in the membrane. So you would have drawn an arrow straight through here, ending at that plasma membrane. So hopefully that was helpful. <laughs> that was on your unit two exam. That's kind of cool. So as we already know, it's a genetic condition. They asked us to identify the most likely cell location of the ribosomes that synthesize CFTR protein. Okay. So number one, they told you that the ribosomes were part of the synthesis. So in case you didn't know that, you could have at least drawn an arrow to ribosomes. You wouldn't have gotten full credit, but at least you knew ribosomes. Um, so they want to know where is the location of these. Well, looking at our picture, we can see that there are ribosomes, right? So you're either going to say they're on the cytosol or you're going to say that they're in the rough ER. You have a 50-50 shot here if you're guessing, okay? So the answer we have is our rough ER, okay, or endoplasmic reticulum, because this is what's going to package that uh, protein up for it to then be moved to its location. Um, so this is an identify point, and a lot of teachers will tell you, you can just write the answer as is, just end up writing just rough ER, B, rough ER. And that's fine. Um, but I always tell my students to write this in a complete sentence just to ensure that you get maximum credit. It would not take that long to say the location is rough ER. Like it's an extra three words and it ensures that it's a complete sentence and ensures that, you, that the reader knows what question you're answering and ensures that the reader knows that you know what you're talking about. So I always recommend writing full complete sentences. Part C says identify the most likely cell location of a mutant CFTR protein that has an amino acid substitution in the ATP binding site. Okay, so the prop told us that the protein sits in the membrane, okay? Functional, non-functional, it's still sitting in the membrane. So the final location would, of course, be in the membrane, in the plasma membrane. Um, and so this was just ensuring that you understood where that protein was going to end up. And again, it's an identify, so you could write this just as, or I would just say the location is the plasma membrane and gotten credit. Um, in case you don't know, anytime where you see on a scoring guideline where there's these parentheses, that means that this kind of word is like optional, like it's extra information um, and you don't really have to have that information there. So you could have just read um, ER in the plasma reticulum or you could have just said in the membrane. You didn't have to specifically say cellular or the plasma membrane. So last FRQ and then we'll open up for Q&A. The petal color of a Mexican morning glory changes from red to blue. The petal colors swell during flower opening. The pigment heavily blue is found in the vacuole of petal cells. Petal colors determined by the pH of the vacuole, a model of the morning glory petal cell before and after flower opening is shown in figure one. And so here we can see figure one. You can see that when it's a bud, it's kind of, of course, smaller. Um, you've got all these H pluses ions in here. You've still got your transport protein, your pump. Um, you can see the pH is six, it's red, and it's small with the cell. Versus in the open flower, it's large, it's blue, and ooh, the pH is 7.7. .7. So that we can see there's less H's in here, there's more of this H pluses. And so look, we're just taking in the diagram, making sure we see everything we have in that diagram, making any notes to the side, things that are weird or things that might help you to answer questions. So part A says identify the cellular component in the model that is responsible for the increase in pH of the vacuole during flower opening. So take a moment, let's think. pH, what is the job, like what, how, how does cheap pH change, okay? Well, if my pH is increasing, so going from a pH of six to a pH of seven, that means that the H pluses that I have is decreasing. Remember the inverse, right? So if your pH decreases, your H plus increase. If your pH increases, your H plus decreases. So they're just inverse of each other, okay? Yes, it's a dance move, whatever. <laughs> um, and so what do I see that's moving these H pluses? Well, I see that this thing's moving H plus in, but 
I know that there's less H pluses. And now I say there's more K's in here. There's more potassium, but less protons or H plus ions. So that tells me that it must be the K plus H plus transport protein. Okay, because of the fact that I go from having a large, large number of H pluses to a low amount of H pluses, I also have no Ks, and now I have a whole bunch of Ks. Okay, so that tells me that it must be the K plus H plus transport protein, or you could have just written this as transport protein. And then the second part says to describe the component's role in changing the pH. As we've already discussed, the pH was changing because the amount of H pluses was less, so the transport protein is moving protons or H plus ions out of that vacuole. So it moves H plus out of the vacuole. So those were two little easy points. Hopefully you got those. Um, part B says that they claim that the activation of the transport protein causes the vacuole to swell with water. And so if we look here, we can see that it is definitely larger, it is swollen with water. Um, and so we're trying to figure out, well, why did the water move in? So remembering back to what we saw with osmosis, if I have a high concentration of something, that makes it hypertonic which means that water is naturally going to flow into that space. And so the concentration of the H plus or the solute increases inside that vacuole, which causes the water to move in. Or you could say the solute moving into the vacuole, making it hypertonic, or you could call it hyperosmotic, or you could say that it lowers the water potential, and that's what drew the water in. So hope that was helpful. Um, if there's any questions that you have about unit two, go ahead and put those into the chat um, while I talk for just a quick moment about something else. Um, but put your questions if you have them into the chat. Um, so as a quick reminder, um, I do have Instagram, AP Bio Penguins, um, and I've been doing daily reviews starting on February 1st. Every day um, I post questions in my stories so that you can have like quick review as well as I, you know, let y'all know when I'm doing these live stream sessions. Um, I have a TikTok. You don't want to follow the TikTok, but in case you just want to watch some fun videos, there's that. And then of course you already know about the YouTube page because you're here and you're having lots of fun doing this. Um, so hope that was helpful. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat, so I am going to end the live. Um, remember, AP by Penguins are dressed for success, and y'all are going to do great.